you, Bobby and EJ, for worship. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I love Bobby does this intentionally. Um, but at the end of a lot of the songs where he backs away from the, the microphone, and then um, uh, I'm not a musician, so I don't really know what he does, but he strums along, whatever that word is. And then what you get to hear is just to hear our voices as a congregation. I find that, like, my favorite part of worship is when uh, we get to hear each other's voices. I think that is incredible to me. So during that time, just sing a little louder for my own sake, because um, I like it. Uh, I think it's cool just to hear us singing the praises of God as the people. Been to a lot of churches in my life. Um, not that they do it right or wrong, but when you feel like it's a concert and it's more about the people on stage, um, I think you get something more out of it, even in the simplicity of what we do here at Alma Heights Baptist Church. But whenever there's that moment where you just pause and you sing together, it's, I think there's something extra that happens there. It's really cool. Anyway, so thank you for singing along. And Kenny, I love when you're here on a Sunday morning and that happens because you belt it out, man. I love you when you're singing, brother. Appreciate you. Um, so we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Um, and this is, uh, we were, I was talking, me and Bobby were talking with uh, Dr. Joe uh, Rangel this week about the Sermon on the Mount and just processing through it. We're going to be, uh, you can turn there, we're going to be Matthew seven thirteen through 14 as you're turning there. And Dr. Rangel brought up this thing about, um, which I don't know if I'd really ever th- thought about it before, where Jesus is, we're getting, we've talked about this, where we're getting the condensed version of what Jesus said. Um, if you read 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, it takes you 15 minutes. That is not Jesus' normal sermon time frame. Um, we find where he preaches for the whole day, feeding the 5,000, and then everybody's like, well, now we're starving. And so um, he typically would preach for a very, very, very long time. I mean, Paul, these early guys, uh, you think we're long-winded. Um, they would preach so long. Uh, you know, one of my favorite stories about Paul is there was a young man who fell out of a window um, because Paul spoke so long into the night that the guy fell asleep and fell out the window and died. Um, and Paul goes down there and prays over him and comes back to life. But the guy's name is Eudicus, or Eudicus and uh, one of the guys says, one of my old professors said, you would have cussed too if you had fallen out the window. Um, was how he remembers that guy's name. Um, but so we have these long sermons that we would see in Scripture. So when we're reading 5, 6, and 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, it is not the totality of what Jesus said. Does that make sense? What we're, we're tracking with me here? We're getting the cliff note, abridged version, highlight reel of what Jesus said. Um, and, and so Dr. Joe was saying, it's like we're getting just ham- like body shots. Boom, 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 boom. We're, Jesus is just teeing off, or Matthew, who's recording it. It's, it's one haymaker for, you know, verses, as Bobby preached on last week, uh, verses 7, or chapter 7, 1 through 12, and then the next one's coming this week, and it's just one right after the another, because this is Jesus's greatest hits, and so um, just pounding away at who we are um, as believers, and, and Jesus is just one shot after another shot. You have a Bible that has or your app that has like the big bold um, statements here in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 and we're actually wrapping up. This 13 and 14 is the introduction to the conclusion. I don't know if that makes sense. In the writing world, I have no idea what that is, but the introduction to the conclusion. So uh, this is like when the pastor says, uh, I've, I'm almost finished, right? But then he speaks for another 20 minutes. Uh, that's the introduction to the conclusion, all right? He's like, I'm almost done, but you still know you got to sit for a while. So Jesus here is, this is his introduction to the conclusion of the Sermon of the Mount. So we have 13 and 14 uh, is the section that I'm speaking on today, the opening part of this conclusion. And then you have the true and false prophets. So we're talking about the narrow and the wide gates. Next week, you've got the true and the false prophets, and you've got the true and false disciples, and then you've got the conclusion on the Sermon on the Mount. What is he concluding? What is he wrapping up? I'm glad you asked. If you're in your paper Bible, or if you're on your app, flip back to chapter 5, and we're just going to do a quick overview of what we've spoken about the last couple weeks here. So in chapter 5, 
you have the Beatitudes starting. But they're not normal Beatitudes. It's not blessed are the rich, blessed are those who are really fun. It's like opposite of what the world would think. It's blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness. So Jesus is turning the tables on what we would traditionally think of those who are blessed. Then you see this next one, that if you look at the next big bold section, salt and light. This idea that we're supposed to be different, something different than the world. We're supposed to be the salt that gives this world flavor or the light that uh, uh, disperses the darkness. Then you go into this idea of the fulfillment of the law where Jesus says, I fulfilled the law because you couldn't. You couldn't do it on your own. So I came in and now I have fulfilled this. I've taken all this stuff and I've made it where you uh, fall short. But now I'm upping it. And so the next section, talking about murder, where it's not just the act of killing somebody, it's having that hatred in our hearts. Adultery is just not the act of it. It's actually lusting and moving in it. He's taking these outward principles that the world sees, and he's shifting it into our hearts. And then you can go in chapter 5 for eye for an eye. Um, The idea that you should get revenge. If somebody does wrong to you, you should do wrong to them. And Jesus says, no, that's not the way to do it. He ends chapter 5 with, you're supposed to love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. And we talked about that. Then he moves into chapter 6 here. And you talk about giving, praying, and fasting. And it's not just that you should sometime do these things if you want to. Uh, Bobby pointed this out. It's as you are praying, as you are fasting, as you are giving. These are things that we should be doing. But not as the world does them. Not for praises of the people. Look how much Leighton gives. Look how much Leighton fasts. Look how much Leighton prays. No, no, no. That's not why you're supposed to be doing these things. That's getting the glory of man. What we're supposed to be about is getting the glory of our Heavenly Father and giving Him praise and glory. And so we, we, we talked about that uh, for a while. And then uh, Bobby brought up the, the section about this is how you pray. When you are praying, pray like this. And we have the Lord's Prayer there. Then you move into, down further into chapter 6 and you have treasures in heaven. This idea of the temporary, this idea of earth and, and the moth and the rust and the thieves breaking in and stealing versus the eternal. Where are we putting our treasure? You can't serve both the temporary and the eternal. You can't serve both God and money. You have to have one or the other. Then uh, he wrapped up chapter 6 with this idea of, Bobby called it the birds and the wildflowers, where this idea of don't worry, be happy. You know, this idea of when we're looking at who we are and our self-worth and our identity, sometimes we get all worked up and anxious in those things, but God says, look, when you look at the birds, I take care of them. They don't worry about what clothes they're going to wear and all those things. The flowers, the same way. Even the wisest of people was not as beautiful as these flowers that God has created. But yet the bird and the flowers, they die. Today they are and tomorrow they die. How much greater are us and our wealth and, and who we are and our value than those? We're doing a review, by the way, because it's the introduction to the conclusion. So, um, chapter 7, Bobby spoke about this last week, this idea of judging others, the plank in your own eye versus the speck in your friend's eye, the ask, seek, and knock. And that brings us now to chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And it reads like this. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter that gate. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find it. When we look at this in context of the whole Sermon on the Mount, we see that Jesus is communicating a better way, a higher way of life. He is saying there's a different system than what comes natural to us. We think this way, God thinks a completely different way. We desire things this way, God desires them this way. We've been told to live, if you remember throughout most of this Sermon on the Mount, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, uh, many times Jesus says, it's been told to you, or you've heard it said that this is the way of truth. And he says, but I am telling you, this is the way of truth. And he keeps redirecting us back to this idea of what is going on in our hearts, what is going on with our relationship with the Father. So, 
I want to read, this is really cool, if you have your phone in the app, uh, you can change the version, change it to the message version. And um, the message version, version reads like this in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, which is a paraphrase. It's not a, I wouldn't build my theology on it, but it does word it differently in a way that is really cool. It says, don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life, the way to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. I don't know what your favorite social media app is that you scroll through, but I not, and maybe it's just, maybe my formula is different than your formula, but they are always sending like quick instant ways to make money. I don't know why I'm always getting those, um, but it's like even the solitaire ads now is like if you play this game for five hours, you can make five dollars. <laughs> it's like, whoa, cool. <laughs> I don't, there's a game that pays you apparently for solitaire. I don't know, um, but they're always like, and maybe it's because I click on them because I'm a, a a small business owner, and it's always like, hey, how to do tax stuff and save millions, and I'm like, all right, yeah, let's watch this one, right? Um, but they're all the same, like, quick formula. They're like, hey, you want to learn how to flip houses with other people's money? Follow these three steps, and I'm always like, everything on these ads is like, how do you get this easier in life? How do you, how do we get there quicker and faster and avoid everybody else's heartache and hard work? And I'm always like, I, I mean, and then you sit there and you watch, and like, what am I watching again? Yeah, we're, <laughs> like, you know, you scroll past it again. But there's all of this, like, quick, instant gratification stuff that is constantly bombarding us in today's world. And when I read it through uh, the message version there, where it says the easygoing formula for a successful life. And I thought, you know what? That is what we are all after. We are after a formula for a successful life. Now, whether you know it or not, or whether we, each person differently. Sometimes you'd say success is just my family. You know, like if I can have a family, own my own home, that's successful. For the next guy, it's got to be billions of dollars in their mind for them to be successful. And God is taking those ideas, those thoughts, and those strategies, and he's saying no matter what your best laid plan is, it doesn't matter. That's not God's plan. God has got a totally different way of doing things. And we, I'm going to steal this entire sermon straight up from a guy named Billy Graham. If you've never heard of him, I love Billy Graham. Um, I heard him preach one time when I was very young, and he changed my entire definition of how I heard people present the gospel. I'll give you this example just because I love it. Dad, do you have any idea what year that was that we went to see Billy Graham in Minneapolis? I should have asked you before now. In the 90s sometime. Um, I was old enough to remember it. Just so you know, the big bands that were playing for him were Michael W. Smith and DC Talk. Yeah. Uh, so um, that tells you about the time frame that it was. Um, it was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was in a place called the Metrodome, and it had sold out with so big of a seating area that they actually put up a, uh, big projectors outside of the stadium, and they estimated 10,000 people watched it from outside the stadium. But it was this incredible event. And Billy Graham gets on stage, um, and he preaches the, the, the concert that happened. <laughs> My mom fell asleep during DC talk. I thought she was crazy. Um, the concert that happened lasted probably, I don't know, an hour. I don't remember. Um, and Billy Graham gets on stage and preaches probably for 10 minutes. That's probably the length of his sermon. And at the end of the sermon, he does an altar call. And I, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. 70,000 people probably in the Metrodome, I imagine it probably sat that many. And, I, and you see a, because they had it on the field too, people sitting. The amount of people that stood up when he did the altar call was so overwhelming that Billy Graham actually tells everybody to sit back down. And he tells everybody to sit back down. And um, he says, I did some, I don't know if he said this. This is my 12-year-old brain interpreting what he said. He said, I must have done something wrong. And for the next 15 minutes, he tries to talk them out of being saved. Um, once again, I'm making up time frames, but this is my small brain, uh, teenage brain thinking through this. Um, 
and he basically just says, I, I did something wrong. I, I, I made this too glamorous. Too many of you people responded when I offered up this salvation message. Um, let me go back and make you truly understand what I'm trying to tell you is that you're, you're signing up for the hardest thing you've ever done. Like, this is the most difficult life choice you've ever made. Too many of you just said yes to it. And, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing what he said again. Um, and then he makes the altar call a second time, and I promise you more people stood up the second time. Um, and the play, like, there's, uh, there's not a, 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 a way to describe the amount of people that came forward and, and made a commitment to Christ that night. And ever since that moment, I remember sitting there thinking the presentation of the gospel that this individual was blessed with, Billy Graham, is unbelievable to me. Ever get a chance to go back and read some of his sermons? But in my uh, intense Googling of these passages, um, I came across in December of 2020, he wrote, so he was already well past his years, he wrote uh, uh, this, um, or it was published then, I guess I don't know if he wrote it then, uh, it was published on his website about this idea of Broadway versus the narrow way. And he brought up some great points, so I just want to share these with you. He said, notice that the broad road is a wide road. In other words, you can enter the gate and carry with you all of your sins. You can carry your selfishness, your prejudice, your hate, your lust, your intolerance, your bigotry. There are no restrictions, there are no uh, inhibitions, and there are no rules on the broad road. Come as you are. Carrying that is heaped upon you. All of the sin that is crushing you down. Bring it all. Dr. Julio, who spoke two weeks ago, brought up this idea of Pilgrim's Progress. If you've never read the story of the Pilgrim's Progress, I highly encourage you to at least get the kids' version of it and read it. But in the old cartoon movie from the 70s that I got to watch as a kid, uh, the Pilgrim's Progress is about a guy named God Road is Wide. It allows you to carry all of your... Um, sins and all your heartaches with you. Then Billy Graham said, the broad road is all... What we see on the broad road, broad road is every aspect of humanity. He said it this way. He said, we see the immoral, the dictators, and the murders. But we also see is the moral people, even church people on this road. The Bible says, which we'll read uh, at the end of um, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 22 through 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, and we did many miracles in your name. Then the Lord will say, not only is it crowded with all of those people, but they're crowded there, and we feel safe there because of conformity. Nobody wants to stand alone for moral courage. What does that mean? It's easier, easier to compromise our morals of who we are than it is to get off the broad road. And I'm trying to stay away from Broadway because, bro- because I keep trying to say the broad road versus the Broadway. Um, please take Broadway, you know, come as, come as often as you want down Broadway. Um, this idea here of, of compromise, of conformity, this idea of all of us um, in this world just trying to herd us like sheep to the slaughter down this path of destruction. He said, not only is it crowded, not only is it wide, but it's also deceptive. Bobby talked about uh, a couple weeks ago in the Sunday school class about Satan's greatest blindness is our blindness to our own sin where we don't see our own shortcomings. We don't see the plank in our own eye. Rather, we are deceived to think that we are okay. That, uh, that if I am a good person, then I can make it into heaven and I'm not on the path of destruction. If I'm sincere and, and, and I follow the golden rule, which Bobby talked about last week in verse 12, one verse up, says, do unto others as you have them do unto you. If I live my life that way, then I'll be okay. God will honor my morals. Or, another way that we are deceived on the broad road is this idea that happiness is found in freedom. 
that we're free because we get to do whatever we want. Look at all the space for activities on the broad road, right? Running around. If some of you are laughing, I'm glad you got the reference. If the rest of you aren't, it's okay. It's a bad reference. Um, but we run around on this road acting like this is where freedom is. But the whole time, we're marching straight to our own destruction. It's, it's a made-up freedom that we're running around on this broad way of road, broad road, uh, to process and to run free because this is what freedom is. Do as I please. Remember, we're talking about the conclusion, the introduction to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And he's been saying for the last couple of weeks as we've read it, no, that's the broad way. That's the way that it's been told to you that you can do those things and that freedom is the American individuality. There's also another deception to this. There's also the deception that says you can never be saved. You don't deserve love. You don't deserve mercy. And God's created you to be alone. That's the other side to this deception. That Satan blinds us to this idea that I cannot be saved. You don't know my past. And so we march with our heads down as Christian and Pilgrim's Progress, carrying our big burdens wide through the wide gate, the broad road, all the heaviness on us, and we just keep walking and walking because this is the lot in life that we've been dealt. And we have been deceived to think that there is no hope. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And the broad, way, broad road has deceived us in that. Billy Graham next brings up this idea that not only is the road broad, not only is it crowded, not only is it deceptive, but it's also fatal. It leads to destruction. The Bible says in Psalms 1-6, the way of the ungodly leads to perish, or shall perish. Romans says the wages of sin is death. Proverbs 16 says there is a way that seems right to a man, but it, that way ends in death. When we look at the broad road, Christ is very clear. You can continue to live your life on the sayings that, that I just combated for the last three chapters in my Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, or you can choose to follow, be salt, be light. You can walk through life trying to earn your salvation, or you can believe that I fulfilled the law. You can walk through life eye for an eye, or you can choose to love your enemies. Jesus is very clear throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, laying these two ideas out before us. And now he's making it very clear. These are two roads, these are two gates that sit before us in our lives. Verse 14, and, and I've said this over and over again. Thank God for the buts in the Bible. Verse 14 says, But there is a small gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Yes, there is a broad way that leads to destruction, but there is also a narrow way that leads to life. Billy Graham said, Thank God that there is a small gate. And Jesus is that gate. When we look at what our life and the sin that we hold, the reason why the gate is narrow is because you can't take that baggage with you. The only way to come through the narrow gate is to take off the sin that so easily entangles us. See, that's what makes the, the story of the two gates so unique is that in the, in the medieval times and even back then uh, uh, in Jesus' times, there was these huge gates. And at night before it got dark, they would close the big gates to the broad way. And then there would be the little gate boop, boop, inside the big gate. And that's when you would, if you got in past curfew and you had to open your window to sneak in your bedroom, none of you had to do that, the, the, that was that gate. You would come and knock to get into the city right? And you would, you, the little guy would open it with the little lantern and would be like, hey, who, who's out there? I'm like, hey, it's just me. I'm sorry, it's past curfew. Okay, come into the narrow gate. 
But here's the crazy part. And, and part of this is a, a, the message about the eye of the needle with the camels that would come into the city past curfew, is that you couldn't make it in that gate. And they weren't going to open the big gates because of the defense. Like if you were surprised attack, all of a sudden we opened the big gate at night, it was over. So they'd only open the little gate, but you had to leave everything outside if you wanted to come in. You had to come in with just who you are. And so those gates were really small because they didn't want a whole bunch of people storming the gates. So the narrow gate would only let you in as you were. And so you had a choice. You had to sit outside and guard your merchandise till the morning till the big gates reopened or to walk through the narrow gate. That is this little gate. Jesus is saying uh, here on the Sermon on the Mount that that narrow gate opens, but you must take off everything that is holding you back. Everything from the previous life, the old life of who we were on the Broadway, we must now leave that behind and must walk into this new narrow way. I always bring up a Greek word or two because it, I think they, or we lose a lot in our English translation. The word narrow here is actually a Greek word for compressed, for constricted, and for affliction. This idea that this narrow road is, 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 is it's a tight road. It's a constricting road. That doesn't sound like fun. In fact, constriction is something uh, that we run from. I remember growing up, you know, no pain, no gain. Pain was almost like a good thing growing up, right? Like, hey, tough through it. Uh, you know, and then uh, we got in a car accident uh, many years ago, and I tore my shoulder, uh, the labrum in my shoulder. And I go to physical therapy, and the guy's like, does it hurt? And I'm like, nah, man. <laughs> you know, it don't hurt. <laughs> you know? And he's like, no, no, you got to tell me, does it hurt? And I'm like, well, you know, like a little bit maybe. And he was like, dude, stop being a man. And he's like, give me your two hands, make two fists. So I made two fists. And he, he I don't even, he might have put like, I don't know, a paper clip on it. And I was like, you know, I, I mean, it was, he pushed down on my hands. My right hand was like, Ugh. this left hand just starts going, boom, 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 boom. And he was like, yeah, you totally ripped your whole labrum apart. You, what are you doing? You're in like incredible pain. And I said, nah, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and so we view pain as this, as this thing to run from, as something like, hey, uh, 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 run away from this pain. Don't cause pain. If it hurts, don't do it kind of thing, um, which is completely foreign to me. Um, but um, it also doesn't mean... It also doesn't mean to become, I think the word is pronounced masochist, uh, where you, uh, there's a, a, a line of priests that used to whip themselves over and over again because they were sinful. And if you're sinful, yeah, you deserved pain. And as a way, they would whip themselves and beat themselves over and over because of how, 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 how much pain and how much sin they were in. I don't think it's talking about that either on the narrow road. In fact, when I look at the narrow road and I began to look at this idea of rules and boundaries. Billy Graham said it this way. He said there's actually freedom. When we look at how God put in place the narrow road and the parameters and the boundaries there for us to follow, he said that's actually where the true freedom is found. He said when you look at engineers, they have to work on the rules that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And if they don't work on the rules of 2 plus 2 equals 4, the building collapses that they were engineering and designing. He said doctors and surgeons must follow protocols. If they don't follow the protocols put in place, the patient dies. A chemist must formulate the equations properly, and he said otherwise the whole college blows up. So there's these rules that we put in place. I added this one. Ikea, you got to follow the stupid instructions because even though part A looks identical to part B to you, they're completely different, right? Sticking Ikea has revolutionized following the instructions because if you don't, you end up with a whole bunch of pieces and your wife's looking at you like, what did you build? <laughs> it's safe, you know? It's all sideways. Ikea has defined you've got to follow the instructions. And if you think part A looks like part B, you did something wrong already. So following these rules, this rule book, this instruction manual. It's not so that life becomes crippling and you lose your freedom. 
It's actually where you find your freedom that you can sit on the Ikea chair and know it's not going to fall apart because you put all the screws in it. You know you can go in for heart surgery because the surgeon isn't just going to invent his own medical rule book on the fly. You know that you can sit in this building that has been, now has been standing for since the 40s. And when you go out, you can actually look up at the beams up there and realize that the engineer way over-engineered that thing, but great for him. But we won't fear a collapse because he followed a structure, a guideline that was put in it. And in that is where the freedom is truly found. We sit up on this huge floor that's over, uh, you know, all of our children, <laughs> and we don't fear falling through and crushing them because we believe somebody has followed the rules and how this thing was designed and built. Now, if I built it, you might want to fear that, but I didn't build this one, so you're good. Billy Graham also compared it to this. He said it's a prisoner in a POW camp. He said, in the prison that Satan has us in, if I promised you that there was a door, but it was only this big, and you had to squeeze out that door, how, who wouldn't take the opportunity to, to get out that door into our freedom? Who wouldn't break off the shackles that Satan has put us in to get away? to run and be free. And I think of the movie The Great Escape where they, they walk through all these tunnels and, and, and all these movies, the unbreakable, uh, uh, the POW mentality that these guys, yet they never stopped trying to escape. It was the duty of every POW to try to escape. And as soon as they were deceived into thinking on the broad way that they were broken and there was no hope, they died in those prisons. It's amazing when you look at that. And, and, and Billy Graham talked about it uh, uh, even more and more about this idea of how we would do anything to get out. There is no third way. And this goes against everything that I believe in with my personal life. <laughs> my dad and my business number both are similar in the fact that it's, it's, no, that way or that way. And I'm always like, guys, there's got to be a third answer to this problem. Like, we can, we can blow the whole thing up or we can figure out a different way to do this. There's got to be a compromise here somewhere. Jesus makes it very clear over these next couple of weeks and in the previous weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, there is no third option. Broadway or narrow way. You're either on the path to destruction or the path to life. You cannot find a third path. So currently, as we sit here, you're not sitting up in the bleachers looking at two, two roads. No, 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 no. Currently, right now, you are on one of these roads. You are either on the Broadway or you are on the narrow way. There is no third option where we're sitting out here and thinking, oh, I wonder which way I'm going to choose. You're not at a fork in the road here. You are either on the Broadway or you were on the narrow way. Now, all along the Broadway, there's gates. They all say Jesus on them. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. And the only way off of that path to destruction is through Jesus. But I think a lot of us are sitting here in life thinking, hey, we're at a, we're at a split. We're at a T in the road. And eventually, I'll make my choice. No, 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 no. You're on the Broadway, or you're on the narrow way. There's no sitting at a stop sign thinking, am I going to turn left or right? That's not how it works here. You are either on it currently, the broad way, or you are currently on the narrow way. So, what is the conclusion to the conclusion of the introduction on the conclusion? Here's the conclusion. If you're an unbeliever, know that you're on the broad way. And know that in a second, you can choose to walk through that gate. But the choice is now, and you're not guaranteed to get out on Broadway and not get T-boned and die as soon as you leave this place. We're not guaranteed the next breath. So as an unbeliever, I plead with you, get off the path of destruction. You are being deceived. Don't look around and say, all oh, my family and friends are doing it. Since when has that ever been a good reason to do anything? 
And if you're a Christian, <laughs> there was a guy named Thomas Lenar- Len- Len- Lenarker. Lenarker. He was a British physician. Somebody of the doctors out there probably know him. He's the one that started the Royal College in the 1400s. He was incredible in Greek and Latin. His whole life he translated uh, Greek and Latin books that were in the medicine world into uh, the English-speaking world. And he didn't get into the Old Testament, or sorry, the New Testament Greek until later on in his life. And as he started reading through it, he said, either this is not the gospel or we are not Christians. <laughs> what he realized was we do not follow the narrow way. He said, either this isn't the gospel, what I'm reading, the Greek manuscripts that I am reading are not the gospel, or we are not Christians. Man, that hit me hard this week. Am I deceived of being on the narrow path, but I'm on the Broadway path? And that is a conclusion that we as Christians must come to, to understand that, hey, that door is so narrow and small, and we can walk in freedom knowing that we are in Christ. And then the conversation becomes, how do we help those How do we open the gate for others to get off the Broadway? How do we open the gate and say, please, walk in the freedom that is true freedom, not in what this life is trying to give you. The sin that so easily entangles and weighs us down, that's not freedom. You think it is, but it just leads to an Ikea collapsed chair because you didn't follow the instructions. Christ is simply saying here, choose the narrow path. Listen to all of the Sermon on the Mount that I just preached to you for the past 12 hours or whatever it was. Now choose the narrow or the broad path. Is it easy? No. Does it always make sense? No. Love your enemies makes no sense to me. But yet, according to what Scripture tells us very clearly, that is the way that God has called us to live. Counterculture, love on our enemies, looking for ways to help those around us that don't deserve it, that is what Christ has called us to. So, I will leave you with this. Are we applying the Sermon on the Mount? Are we just listening to the Sermon on the Mount? And I think that's where the next couple weeks, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is giving us, that's what he's asking. Are we going to be wise? Are we going to be foolish? Because now that we've sat through the Sermon on the Mount, Are we applying it, or will we just listen to a good story? Lord, we love you. Thank you for everything that you have given us. Thank you, God, that you made it so crystal clear. There was no confusion in the way that you spoke. God, give us the strength to make the tough decision to daily walk through that narrow gate. Give us the strength daily, God, to confess our sins and to try to find that narrow road of life that you have marked out for us to walk as individuals. We love you, Lord. We're grateful that we don't have to do this life together, that we have the body of Christ that meets at Alamo Heights Church. We also have you that walk daily with us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, No Wednesday night services uh, this week. It is spring break week, and no men's coffee on Wednesday as well, guys. Love you all. We'll see you next week.